Well, hello there and welcome to another edition of Warbird Wednesday. My name is Fred Bell and we are back. I hope you had a Merry Christmas. Greg and I wish you all the merriest of merry that you had. Now, we are headed into New Year's and of course, Greg, you know what that means, Greg. It means party on. Now, Greg has managed to turn me into, Greg has long hair. You, you, Greg is very camera shy. But basically, Greg is turning me into him, I think. The secret, Greg, is I actually, I think, had hair that was this long at one time. Greg is like, oh, okay. So with that, Greg, party on, dude. Good night, gonna, party on. Was that party heartfelt? On, I think that was heartfelt. I'm going to toss this off camera. Good catch. And I'm, oh, that is liberating to get that off my head. There we go. And the wig goes off and the glasses Come on. Oh, I can see now, Greg. So today we are working in an area of the British aircraft that were significant in World War II. And of course, we're going to be working on one of the most significant planes uh, in the British arsenal in that time, and that is the Hurricane. Now, the Hawker Hurricane. Now, very, very interesting aircraft. Not as sexy, I'm going to use the term sexy here, as the Spitfire. Everybody thinks about the Spitfire, and I think primarily, Greg, probably the shape of the Spitfire. I don't know why, but the Spitfire, in my eye, looks a little bit more uh, aerodynamic, if you want to claim that, or a little bit more of a fighter. The, the Hurricane is a little more stubby. I would say, if you want to call it that, we'll give you a plan view of the airplane. Now, the interesting thing about the Hurricane is the Hurricane actually, the British were fantastic aircraft designers. They, they did a ton of stuff. And you can't take away from the advancements that the British have made in the field of uh, aviation. The stuff that they did with wood aircraft and, and working out of wood, out of World War I, and, and moving things forward with, with various materials is, is just amazing. And in this case, now this aircraft was originally, a lot of this airplane started out as fabric and wood, Greg, if you didn't know that, the wings, some of the other sections of the airplane. Now the idea behind it, and the designer was Sir Sidney Cam, the idea with old Sidney was that the RAF could service the aircraft in the field. The aircraft did not have to go to depots to be serviced as much. It could be maintained in the field by crews. It had to be durable. It had to be tough. It was derived from the Fury, which was uh, the British at the early point in the 1930s loved biplanes. They absolutely loved biplanes. And the Air Ministry had a predilection towards biplanes. But the old, good old Sydney decided that he was going to take the Fury design and, and make it a, uh, a low-wing monoplane. And that's what he came up with the, the Hurricane. Now, my Yokund assistant today uh, doesn't realize that this airplane actually flew in 1935, if you can believe that. So we're talking about, of all of the fighters that we've ever reviewed, this is one of the earliest ones that actually made the jump into uh, World War II and, and I don't want to say survived, but it was fairly successful. A lot of those early 1930s or mid-1930s designs just didn't make the cut when they got, when they ran into uh, the late 1930s, very early pre-war designs, but this one actually did quite well. Now, it first flew in 1935. It was introduced in 1937. So again, earlier than a lot of the counterpart aircraft that it would run into. Remember, the British had ascertained quite astutely that the, uh, the winds of war were gathering in Europe. And they believed that they were eventually going to have to fight uh, on the continent. So the aircraft was prolifically produced. There were 14,487 of them built, so quite a bit of aircraft uh, were actually turned out. Uh, George Bullman, Flight Lieutenant George Bullman was the first guy to take it up. He was the prototype pilot. 
Uh, it was rushed into service from there. By the time of the outbreak of World War II, they were 18 squadrons in Britain that were equipped with the hurricane. Now, at that point, we're, remember, British biplanes at that point, if they had run into an ME-109, an early 109, or a low-wing fighter, were probably, we've talked about it before, I used toast, or if you want to use a, a fighter parlance, they were easy meat for, for these low-wing fighters because they were so much faster. And so the British were pulling all of those aircraft out and uh, those, those obsolete aircraft, and they were throwing these in. The Spitfire was produced even more frantically because that was going to be the companion airplane. But they, they were rushing these to the point where they had 18 squadrons. It had very rugged construction. The British, as I said initially on this airplane, there's a lot of wood, wood wings, fabric. There was wood back in the, in the fuselage. The front part of the airplane was primarily metal around the engine. Later, as the design progressed, and there are so many different designs of this airplane that we, it would, this would be a two-hour Warburg Wednesday if I actually talked about that. But um, different, uh, as the design progressed, more metal went on the airplane. It was more durable. But some of that wood construction uh, actually made the airplane uh, more durable in combat, could suffer battle damage. Now, it also did one other thing. You know what that was, Greg. The aircraft had a tendency to burn. This was an airplane that uh, if, you, if you hit them in the right area, the aircraft would catch fire, and there were a number of British casualties on the airplane burning, and we'll talk about that uh, one significant one in just a second. When the war actually broke out in Europe, and the British had really hoped against going to war, the got to remember, on the continent, the loss of life between the various combatants was horrific, and there were people that just did not want to go to war. In fact, and I may have mentioned this before, but you could really argue that the collapse of the British Empire uh, later was from the level of casualties that they suffered in World War I. Remember, they sacrificed probably the cream of the crop of that generation in World War I that would have been very influential in those interwar years, and those people just weren't there because they got wiped out. So the British, understandably, did not want to go to war, but when the winds of war gathered, they actually went to support the French, and they forward deployed a number of these hurricane squadrons. Now, there was one problem with that, Craig, and that problem was the Blitzkrieg. The Nazis and the Germans had realized they weren't going to fight a trench war anymore. They were going to, we've talked about Blitzkrieg, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but they had developed lightning war. They put all their mechanized infantry into this Blitzkrieg to like, break through, and they were very successful. The British and the French and the Poles and the Czechs and everybody on the continent paid the price for that because they thought they were going to fight the last war. The British squadrons that were forward deployed into Belgium and into France, what do you think happened to them, Greg? They had overrun quickly because once the Germans broke through the uh, defensive lines in the various areas there, they were clocking off 30, 40 miles a day. These, uh, the airfields were not well protected because they were fairly far behind the front. And pretty soon you had these uh, forward deployed British uh, aircraft squadrons being completely overrun. Eventually, the British fell, fell back to Dunkirk. There was furious fighting over Dunkirk because the British were trying to evacuate. Everybody knows about Dunkirk. Not going to expend a lot of time on it. But there was um, uh, 178 hurricanes uh, abandoned in France that could not get out of there. The aircraft that actually got off the continent were 66. And those were, uh, they were uh, evacuated June 21st. So you could see the British left behind not only most of their equipment on the continent for their army, which thank goodness the Germans never got across the English Channel, but they also lost a lot of those airplanes. Now, in the fighting over Dunkirk, the British would claim 499 kills. So the Germans, 
But remember, the Germans had about 2,000 airplanes, 2,500 airplanes. They had incredible air superiority. Now, I am in front of our Battle of Britain exhibit today. We're going to go ahead and put this back on the stand briefly. And today is my salute to British air crews. The British were just amazing and their resolve was amazing and to go up and fight every day against an enemy that you were evenly matched the uh the me 109 the e's uh were, were an evenly matched opponent against either either the spitfire or the hurricane the hurricane had a max speed of about 340 miles an hour it was fairly fast but uh if you went into up against a, a 109 uh, you had your hands full. Even a 110, we're going to talk about 110s in a second, uh, a BF-110, you still had your hands full. But the crews that flew these airplanes, the people that maintained them, the armors, and the British people uh, in general just refused to surrender. And you, you have to uh, respect that level of fortitude. And the RAF has a tremendous legacy, and this particular aircraft goes back to that legacy. So I am going to salute you. Now what I'm going to do today, Greg has held his, um, by the way, I heard a little bit of a fizz when I popped it. So we have carbonation there for you at home where there was carbonation. So people are keeping calendar of how many different attempted poisonings, Greg, this one may not be that, but in the honor of uh, New Year's, Greg has really outdone himself. Really, Greg, you have you've gone all out. Greg has got me rocket piss butterscotch soda because you know you launch rockets on New Year's fireworks. I, a clever move, Greg. I like it. Um, a bitter butterscotch soda, soda that glows in the dark. Very yeah. Greg's like yippee. Uh, let's see, 160 cal. Rocket piss soda. Who bottles this stuff? Where do you find this? And the little eyebrows went up there. Uh, Earth-friendly recyclable bottle. That's the first time I've ever seen that. All right. Uh, this breaks the rule in that it doesn't have pure cane sugar on the label. So uh, these people, the rocket piss people, have to think about, oh, it's just glowing in the dark. Is that it? Greg, you're a sick man. All right, so for those of you who are getting ready to uh, celebrate New Year's, Greg, at this point, you've left me speechless. Okay, I will come back. He broke my concentration. For those of you who are going to celebrate New Year's and the British people who fought so valiantly with the, uh, the hurricane, I salute you. Whoa. I don't think that's bad. I just think that is a nasty flavor. I don't know. I don't even know how to describe that. It's it's rocket piss. That's <laughs> that's the only thing I can come up with. Oh, that's nasty. Second sip, customary. Mm. Yeah, Greg. Oh, Ugh. that is definitely not something that. I think anyone would drink. I, I will not recommend it. So the um, we talked about the aircraft. Uh, the big challenge with it is it had a tendency to burn, which was a problem. Um, it was fairly heavily armed, and it was fairly maneuverable. Now, the Battle of Britain, we're talking about the Battle of Britain, uh, Archie McClellar, had 21 kills, one of the highest scorers, or the highest scorer. And then uh, Eric Nicholson was a VC recipient. Now, interesting thing, we're talking about burning. He got bounced by some BF-110s. The aircraft was hit, started to burn. He actually was going to get out of the airplane, saw one of the 110s go after one of his other compatriots, got back in the airplane, and now it is fully engulfed in flames and shot down the 110. So he was a, a feisty guy. So he, uh, but there were, you know, there, are, and that's one that you know about. There are probably hundreds of stories that we don't know about and acts of valor 
because the British were there were up against the wall in the Battle of Britain and they fought on. Now, the uh, Hurricane Aces, are you ready, Greg? We're going to go through these here. Uh, Marmaduke Patel, William Vale, Frank Carey, Carol Ket Kettle Washer, that's an interesting one, uh, Vic Woodward, Willie McKnight, Richard Stevens, Richard Cork, there's a Czech pilot here, uh, Josef Fratniski, a, a Polish pilot, Wilhold Rubano Czechowitz, um, Ian Gleed, Mark Henry Brown, and an Indian was uh, Aaron Singh. So it had an Indian pilot. So that gives you an idea. This aircraft was deployed all over uh, anywhere that the British fought, basically on every continent. It was in North Africa. It fought in the Pacific. Um, there was a tro in, in North Africa, there was a trop version, a tropical version of this. The, it, fought, um, in the, uh, it fought in the Pacific. The interesting thing about the Pacific was, guess what, up against the Zero. Zero's a Bantamweight fighter. It, it didn't fare as well. I mean, it was okay, but it wasn't a great aircraft in the Pacific. Uh, and also the, the flight level was down lower. The Zero, as we talked about, was highly maneuverable. This one, not so much, more of a traditional fighter in the European sense. Uh, and so, but it fought in the Pacific. There were even, uh, they flew off carriers. Uh, and it was, um, it actually, um, was actually launched off catapults off ships. Now, if you can think about this one, you're in the Atlantic you're a hurricane pilot in the Atlantic and you get the uh, notice to go. Guess what, Greg? There are no airfields out there. Guess what happens? That's a one-way trip. Basically, you do what you gotta do. Typically, what they were doing was they were f providing uh, fighter escort because the Germans, you had the uh, Condors that were out there, big four-engine maritime bombers. Uh, the Germans had a JU-88s out there, maybe Hankel 111s, but they they didn't have, this was earlier in the war, they didn't have a lot of uh, Jeep carriers and these carriers to launch off of. So these aircraft were, were launched off steam catapults. You had to hope that when you ditched the airplane, you uh, the ship would actually stop and pick you up because you were totally at the mercy of the crew that was on that ship. Once you launched, there's no going back. And that happened many, many times. And there are a number of uh, pilots in those aircraft that were lost. So what is the legacy of the airplane? Clearly, Battle of Britain is the legacy of the airplane. Um, it went to fight on in the war, but I would say by 1944, it was hopelessly outclassed by just about everything in the field and the aircraft, although it continued to be updated. It was actually produced up until 1944, if you can believe that, Craig. But uh, by 1944, it was a second line aircraft comparable to, I would say like a P-40, maybe early P-51s, um, you know, but it, was, it, was, it wasn't as bad as a Brewster Buffalo, which there's almost no comparison. Brewster Buffalo, by the way, may be the worst fighter ever built. Someone can come after me in the comment section on that. But uh, it was hopelessly outclassed. It was developed into the Typhoon, if you can believe that, which was a tremendously uh, excellent uh, ground attack airplane. In fact, Typhoons were, were the terror of the Germans in, um, in uh, France later in the war. But it, by that point, it had kind of served its usefulness. Now, it lives on. This is one of the aircraft that there are not, uh, that it just didn't go into the scrap pile. I would say probably, what do you think? Primarily because of Battle of Britain and the British fondness for it. But there are 17 of these aircraft airworthy. That is a big number. The, probably the largest number of World War II fighters that are airworthy is the Mustang, the P-51 Mustang, but 17 airworthy hurricanes is, is a fairly big number. So I'm going to go ahead and put this back. Now, Greg, 
you know, what I, I, we're going to talk about what I gave you for Christmas, of course, which was this fine coloring book. Greg got one of these. He's learning to stay in the lines. He's doing much better. And, and he's actually getting the airplanes kind of closer in color as well. But uh, if you would love to have this, this is a really actually a very cool coloring book for somebody in your, in your family that's, a, that's an aficionado of World War II airplanes. This actually has a hurricane in it. And if you will click on the link, Jason will gladly send you one of these post haste. Maybe, yeah, you could get it before the new year. You could ring in the new year with your coloring book. So you might want to do that. Now, we cannot, and I say this all the time, do these restorations without your donation. So click on the link below. We could use a donation. If you have come across us on YouTube, you now have experienced the joy, the New Year's, the impending New Year's joy that is Warbird Wednesday. Send us to a friend. You'll never get anybody that is enjoying the hats like we are enjoying the hats. And the who else takes one for the team and drinks Rocket Piss Soda? But, you know, on, it's almost New Year's. Why not, Greg? So uh, forward us to a friend. Like us on YouTube. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Like us on Facebook. My name is Fred Bell. I am the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. Thank you so much for visiting us and have a happy new year.